Two missiles, still good to fight. 8,000 pounds of fuel. Yeah, that's another thing. If you're gonna, you know, with a realism of DCS, take into account your fuel. Eyes on smoke. Yeah, so you said eyes on smoke. So if you have smoke in the air, that's usually called that a missile was uh, fired. When you're in a low altitude environment or you're in an air to surface or air ground environment and you might have troops on the ground, they can mark a target with smoke. Here we go into the merge. So jumping right into DCS, one of my favorite things about the game is kind of just the touch into detail or like the realism they do in terms of kind of mocking up the cockpits. They are very, very close to what they look like in real life and how much attention and detail and just the overall realism. I've never flown a Su-27 or Russian aircraft before, but you know, you can see that this is way more realistic than some of the other videos that I've taken a look at in the past in terms of like the dog fighting between the flanker and uh, the F-16. You see how both aircraft are putting out uh, in this scenario like flares, but you know, when you're dog fighting, whether in training, absolutely something you're going to put out to potentially defeat a missile either coming at you or so they can't get a proper weapon solution to shoot at you. It's almost like a fifth gen fighter at this point in a dog fight like that. You can also definitely see the Su-27 cockpit. You know, you can see these gauges, these steam gauges, and they don't have the nice kind of displays that we do. Some of the United States are allied fighters. You know, that's just like flying the aircraft generally, fine. But, you know, when you're trying to operate it in a complex environment and everything else that goes along with that, it's way, way more difficult. You know, that's something that we'll also, in real life, will take into account in training, is that we'll have minimum safe distances or like a bubble that we won't get any closer to another aircraft as we dogfight just to prevent like a mid-air collision but if you're doing it for real in like a combat scenario you might get as close as possible for kind of various tactical reasons shot guns i think i saw guns i'm slow i know but yeah where is he in the circle there we go he just cannot react fast enough you see yeah so we talked about high off foresight there that's going to be employing a usually an IR guided missile. If you're looking down the, straight down the aircraft, that's the bore sight. So a high off bore sight would be like if I'm trying to shoot it 45 degrees, you know, 60 degrees, 70, 80, so on and so forth, off access or off the bore sight of the aircraft. So necessarily your nose doesn't need to be pointed at the aircraft. You can shoot him kind of as he's looking over to his right if you have a weapon that's able to do so and you're able to cue it in a proper manner. You know, you can also see just how different these two aircraft are. Like. Su-27, two-engine fighter versus F-16, a single-engine fighter. The Su-27 comparison is a gigantic aircraft in comparison to the F-16. So they have different strengths and weaknesses, not just only like in flying just qualities, but specifically in dogfighting or BFM or ACM kind of scenario. You can see the F-16 there kind of obviously lost as they got hit. So depending where you get hit, if it's kind of a nose-on missile impact or gun round impacts the canopy or the cockpit area, probably not going to be survivable. But, you know, if it's just a proximity fuse that's blown up from the warhead and it's ripped through flight controls, hydraulics, kind of electrical wiring, or so on and so forth, that might just cripple the airplane where you're going to slowly lose control of it. So you'll be able to eject to survive, ideally, the ejection. So you'll kind of lift to fire another day from there. But yeah, if it's kind of a head-on collision just due to the kinetic energy and where you're sitting, where the missile or the gun round impacts, unfortunately, that might not be survivable. Yeah, so you can see that his wingman there shooting, a, I would assume, a beyond visual range uh, missile at someone. Missile, missile in the air. So it looks like, yep, Su-27s versus two F-15s, it looks like. Yeah, so we talked about, hey, like, if you sense that you're being shot at or you're being targeted, chaff flare, especially if you don't know what kind of missile is coming at you, is that you want to get out there. You definitely do have a limited amount of them. I wouldn't necessarily like a small quantity, but it'll give you indications uh, depending what aircraft you fly and where it's displayed on how many you have left remaining. So we'll usually give you like a some kind of oral warning or tone to let you know that, hey, you're kind of running out of them. It's also a scenario you don't want to be in where you're just kind of flying along and we'll jokingly call it like fat, dumb, and happy where you don't really know what's going on or you don't have full situational awareness. And now all of a sudden, in a split second, you're reacting to potentially a missile being shot at you. It's going to introduce stress and you don't have the full kind of picture of what's going on. Ideally, you might have like an airborne early warning control aircraft out there that's kind of with their gigantic radar. It's going to be way, way bigger than in a fighter sized aircraft and what they can fit in their nose or wherever their radar is that they can look out they can now give you you know 10 15 or maybe even longer kind of notice that there's an aircraft out there and then you can kind of try to solve whether it's a friendly or hostile aircraft 
The A4 is a great jet, but I, I must tell you, I feel a little bit challenged here. So we're going a little old school here. Desert Storm and A4. Looks like he can get energy a lot faster than me. That's that's why he's a better rate fighter. You can hear that guy just talking about one circle, a rate fighter. Each aircraft's going to have their own strengths and weaknesses. So the two kind of fighter, or the two type of fights that you'll get it into potentially are a one circle and a two circle fight. The two different types of fights are going to be a one circle versus a two circle fight. And a one circle fight is going to be for the turn radius of the aircraft. So you'll hear it as like a turn radius fighter. And that's going to be how many uh, feet it takes for it to execute a turn. Where a two circle fight, a turn rate is going to be how many degrees per second it takes for that aircraft to kind of get around that same circle. So you'll play to your strengths, try to highlight their weaknesses. So you can see, hey, with an A4, never flown an A4. But you can look up kind of their EM diagram, their energy maneuverability diagram of your aircraft or in your kind of tactics or center operating procedures. And that's going to kind of give you an indication of, hey, where you are, either where you operate better as a turn rate or turn radius, one circle versus two circle. And then you'll have your own intelligence sources that are going to make that same determination for which hopefully which aircraft you're going up against. And if you're a one circle, a turn radius and you're going to get to two circle, which is a turn right fighter, you'll try to force that fight into a one circle as much as possible. But we can definitely see that DCS is the most realistic game and set of videos that we've taken a look at so far. You're working with a very, very detail-oriented cockpit or mock-up cockpit that they've done. You know, if you were just to fire up the video game and play, it doesn't have that arcade style that might not appeal to everybody. It's not as potentially fun. But it's definitely more realistic. Already in a bad position. I lost some some speed on that one, and he's uh, about to outrage me. You know, if you take a look into the sun, it's you take a look at it too long. It's going to cause problems with your vision. So you can't visually acquire that aircraft. That's going to be an issue. So you'll use that uh, to your advantage if you if you can. You know, we even have in training, we have a radio call that, hey, if you can't see the other aircraft, you call blind. But if you're blind because of the sun, you, you might call like, hey, blind sun. Being in the sun, if you can kind of move in that, that line of sight of where the other person's looking, uh, you can definitely use that to your advantage and it, it, it will work. So we're getting uh, a little bit more into my bread and butter with the F-18. You know, this is going to be the Legacy model, not the Super Hornet and the uh, F-837. The Legacy Hornet versus Super Hornet is going to have a pretty significant uh, difference between the cockpit. But if you just externally look at the aircraft, there's very, very subtle differences. The Super Hornet's bigger. It's got the rectangular intakes, a couple of other things. But inside the cockpit, you know, the Super Hornet's a little bit more modern. We have an upfront control panel that's a touch panel instead of all these switches and buttons that they have right underneath the HUD. Our displays are a little bit more modern. They're not the monochrome kind of green. And this is what we were flying three, four, five, six years ago. Nowadays, they have the Block 3 Super Hornets coming on, uh, online. And they're gonna have even more of an upgraded cockpit setup or cockpit suite. What is an SA-5? I don't engage those very often. But if you're looking through the HUD, usually the, the HUD is very, very similar in terms of information that's being displayed from a Legacy Hornet to a Super Hornet. So it's kind of just this generic stuff, his pitch ladder, his heading indicators, his airspeed, altitude, his alpha, his Mach number, his uh, current G, his max G, that's all gonna be the same uh, in the Super Hornet. <laughs> could be worse, you could be in Vigan. All you hear is Gosh. with all this sound. You can also see how it's definitely, like you have blue sky and you have a blue ocean. Sometimes it can get very, very disoriented, and especially if you get some kind of, you know, low cloud layer without a horizon and you have an air and a surface that are very, very similar colors. It's get very, very disoriented. So you gotta rely, you know, on your instruments. So you can see how he's got the heads, heads up display and then as you kind of look off the site, he was getting another display. So if you're wearing a joint helmet, think about the queuing system or Johannix, you will get that displayed in your helmet and it will be slightly different than your heads up display. But if you're not, then you know, you're know you just wearing a normal, just regular visor that you can just lift up and down manually that has no kind of uh, electronic hookups to the aircraft other than your communications cord. If you look outside the heads up display and you're kind of looking up and behind you or just not just in that general environment, you lose all that information. Wait for me! <laughs> Come on, guys. You're all very, very fast, you bastards. All right, I'm going to keep it 460, 470 ish. So, when we look at, when we do any kind of like air to air mission, we'll normally uh, just about all the time do a debrief. And we have debriefs kind of where you saw those 
three blue planes flying along. Well, something kind of similar where you can go back and rewatch the flight or the flight and you can see how you did because, you know, you're flying your own little bubble. You're sharing information with your flight and you might have a general idea of what went on, but you might go back to the debrief and see that there was other aircraft out there that you didn't know. You might have been simulated killed by another missile that wasn't somehow relayed over to you to the radio or the frequency was too busy. You know, that's definitely a valuable learning tool that after the flight you'll go and you can review the flight and see how it went. Eyes on smoke. SA-8. Eight front. Yeah, so you said eyes on smoke. So if you have smoke in the air, that's usually call that a missile was uh, fired. When you're in a low altitude environment or you're in an air to surface or air ground environment and you might have troops on the ground, they can mark a target with smoke. So you can, we talked about visually identifying targets when you're down low is relatively hard. But as they're in the pop now, you know, you're up at altitude, you get a better scan off the ground, that's very, very apparent where the target is by just trying to pick it up visually or on a chart or on your target environment. Missile, missile, missile. Two missiles fired. Three missiles fired. We talked about the benefits and some of the negatives of being down low. You can see, hey, they weren't getting shot when they were further away or at a high altitude, but now they're in this kind of terminal, low altitude environment where you unfortunately lose the, the hair here or there. When you hear that radar warning receiver start spiking like that, that just means someone's scanning me, they're locking me up. That's probably a friendly. It's shown as a MiG-29. Yeah, so he kind of just gave you a quick explanation of what the radar warning receiver or RWR was that we had talked about earlier with different types of aircraft. That communications call, uh, you know, he's taking off from land, but that sounds more of, you know, Mark and Mom's, you know, he gave a, a bearing and a distance. It's more when you're talking to the carrier and you're approaching uh, and you're kind of trying to give them a indication of where you are so they can do their kind of identification of friendly or foe. It's really easy to get caught up in all the Info, systems and I end up getting like stuck looking down here in the cockpit and I lose situational awareness. It gives yeah, so as he's talked about situational awareness, that's definitely something that you can kind of get stuck and it's looking at your displays being heads down, trying to either work the radar problem or being on your targeting pipe and trying to find uh, something on there or just being heads down and you're not outside, you're not scanning for family like so you don't fly into your wingman or other flight members, but so you can pick up other you know, enemy aircraft that are airborne. You might pick up a smoke plume from the ground or airborne of a missile being shot or a gun round being shot or something, just something along those lines. You have to kind of timeshare between being heads down, actually look at your displays and kind of like look, just looking outside so you can, you know, get the best of both worlds. And that's why with some of the, the newer fighters with the displays where the information is displayed, it makes it much easier to go heads down real quick, look at your navigation or your situational awareness display or your radar or your targeting pod. It is on the way. So you can see he's got AC-1 there, kind of in his pitch ladder directly in the HUD. When you have A, it's gonna be for an AMRAM. C will be the variant, so it'll be A120C. And then the one will be, hey, he has one left on board there. Another thing, you can see him switching to different radar modes. So, you know, if he went to like a boresight mode, then he went to a, kind of a vertical scanning where you saw the kind of dashes going up and down. He's just trying to prioritize his radar to gain radar awareness of this aircraft by putting this radar in the best mode possible, or that he thinks possible. He's damaged. I got a good tone on my AIM-9X. Yeah, then he also mentioned the tones. So look at different tones from your AIM-9 mic, AIM-9X, or uh, whatever kind of infrared guided missile you're carrying to tell you like, hey, while that seeker head on the missile is looking in at that target, it might not have a good lock on. So if you fire the missile, you know, it's not radar guided, so it might just go off in a straight line or somewhere where it doesn't pick up the aircraft. So if you get a good tone, hopefully that's a good indication that, or should be a good indication that the missile's gonna come off and hit the aircraft or, you know, it's gonna guide at least towards it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and retreat here since I don't have visual on whatever's chasing me. He's getting either indications on board that he's getting targeted or someone else out there that he can't visually see or he's not getting any kind of indication on this place that someone's out there. There are ways to handle that, whether it gets your aircraft maneuvering so you can throw your sensors where you think they're coming from or, you know, if you think someone's visually has acquired them, you can use the cloud layers as you go through the cloud layers to hopefully break that visual from the other aircraft and hopefully you can pick them up. Two missiles, still good to fight. 8,000 pounds of fuel. Yeah, that's another thing. If you're in a, you know, with the realism of DCS, 
take into account your fuel. Fighter aircraft, they're, you know, you're not in an airliner, so you don't have hours plus of fuel or even in like a tanker kind of aircraft. The more you're an afterburner in like a dogfight or an ACM or BFM, the more fuel you're gonna be burning. And that's definitely a factor where you'll set a joker or bingo number. And both of those numbers are gonna provide an oral tone to you when you surpass a certain fuel lever. You know, if you hit your bingo fuel, it's it's time to head home now. There's there's no delay, I can't keep fighting. This is my preset amount of fuel I have. You know, I've set aside to get home. Otherwise, uh, I need to land somewhere else. I need to divert into somewhere else. Or if you're, you know, like over enemy uh, territory, which is like a scenario that uh, this guy's in, depending on the field to get back home, you might have to eject over water or over, uh, you know, hostile land, which is uh, never going to be a good thing to do. And we're going to have to fly through a lot of red air to get there. When I say red air, I just mean. Um... If you're operating in a dense electronic attack kind of an environment, you might be getting false returns or incorrect returns, either on purpose or just from what they're trying to do to you, or just on uh, your radar is picking up kind of wrong information. You know, there's a lot of ambiguity, and a very important part is getting the correct information displayed to you. And then if there is any ambiguities, you know, kind of making that determination on board or talking to your other flight members or whoever else you're working with to help, you know, kind of solve that problem. That's a ground attacker. That is a fighter. You know, you might not be able to 100% say what, what they are based on their altitude or airspeed. You can make a reasonable guess and then you might have priorities where, you know, if you're in a role where he might be in right now or he's trying to destroy fighters, he might be targeting people like he did, who are higher and faster, or he might be trying to avoid those and destroy, hey, the helicopters that are lower and slower, where he assesses that they're a little bit less of a threat. And then he was also kind of getting into like a missile conservation kind of mindset where he didn't want to burn his last AMRAM. So he might prioritize that against a helicopter where he's not as worried about getting as close to that aircraft because it's, he's got a reasonable guess that it's a helicopter. But he might save that AMRAM for one that's further away. This was a little more realistic, not so much in terms of the game, but the communications the pilots were using by something, you know, like a war thunder, you know, where it's not the, necessarily the actual flying, but it's the, you know, just the procedural stuff. That's where I think a game like this, um, or like a simulator is going to hold its most weight, not the actual flying, but in the, you know, running the checklist and the procedures and getting that initial exposure. Hey Gameology, thanks for sitting through with me with another Expert to React. If you want to check out more videos like this, go follow Gameology on Facebook or YouTube. You can follow me on Instagram at DGREGR. I hope to see you guys again on another Expert to React.